last few years, uh, I should say, several calls for, um, I'm not going to say engagement now, but rather say a, um, a drawing a closer close connection between concerns in the philosophy of connected actions, uh, social ontology, and more applied uh, issues, such as issues in uh, political theory. Uh, and uh, I was uh, very happy to see um, that uh, we have an, uh, a conference that at, at least by its title is devoted to doing exactly this. Uh, and uh, so this uh, work in progress of mine sort of fits uh, the bill at least under one description and we can, uh, we can see how far that goes. Um, so I'm going to try um, to do the following and hope they, um, uh, you can see enough of the screen as it's projected now. Um, I'm going to do the following. I wanted to talk about uh, the normativity of international cooperation, uh, but in um, uh, a sort of methodologically organized fashion in the way that I want to talk about normativity of cooperation, uh, say more in general with regard to small scale uh, cases, and I'll, I'll sort of zero in on um, a particular variant. I won't worry too much about giving uh, real life uh, examples for the small scale cases. I think that's pretty much clear uh, what we talk about when we uh, want to bring out the conceptual apparatus uh, there. Um, but uh, I'll highlight um, the ways in which um, at least, and also some other scholars have said that commitments uh, and agreements uh, can matter in uh, cooperation. Uh, and then I'll do what I said uh, was is sort of um, a, a task, a future task for debates in social ontology. Uh, I'll take it to a rather applied uh, field that is uh, the field of international cooperation. And I'll give, uh, well, depending on time, I'm two minutes in now, uh, depending on time, uh, I'll give a, a rather extensive uh, illustration of what uh, I have in mind uh, with respect to the European <coughs> Union. Um, and, uh, well, that's uh, what I'd like to offer uh, for this um, discussion. So let's say, um, starting from a, uh, not a definition, but uh, let's say a hopefully not very um, uh, conflictual uh, characterization of what cooperation is. Let's say it consists in the intentional pursuit of a common goal by two or more agents. Uh, that seems to me pretty straightforward. It's not maybe not specific enough. Uh, maybe we can we want to say there are stronger or weaker forms. Raimo Tomila has made um, um, many many uh, more uh, distinctions there. Uh, both what the strength um, uh, of the uh, intentionality is, or the kinds of intentionality, uh, and uh, of course others in the room uh, have also contributed to a much more, um, say, differentiated picture of uh, co co what cooperation can consist in. But let's work with that. And just say uh, that cooperation, central kinds of cooperation, involve specific normative relationships between the agents involved. So some kinds of cooperation. I'm just talking about the structure of specific kinds of cooperation. I'm not talking about the nature uh, of cooperation. That's a different project. Uh, uh, some interests there, commitments maybe, uh, but uh, that's not that's not the uh, the issue right now. So there are cases where um, pe people, agents, two or more, uh, will end up um, cooperating. That also involve specific normative relationships between them. Um, and one kind of case is where um, two or more uh, respond to an external urgency. So that's um, the, the, the kind of scenario you see in uh, the shallow pond uh, cases, the variations of a case where um, two people uh, are in a position to rescue a drowning swimmer. Uh, and uh, let's say that this, they are in a position to do so um, means uh, that they can only do so together. 
So there is an external urgency, someone needs help, they need to cooperate. And if that's the case, uh, uh, they need to cooperate, they can only help together, uh, that puts them in a situation that is both, uh, I think, uh, best characterized as involving a joint uh, duty uh, on their part and um, also comes with a specific uh, normative tie uh, between them vis-a-vis -vis their joint duty. And there are other cases of cooperation that uh, I think should be characterized as involving normative relationships and the, those are uh, what I want to call cooperation by agreement. And that's what I'm going to be focusing on here. With respect to cooperation by agreement, I think we need an account of how a normative relationship between the cooperators, specifically their mu mutual rights and obligations, comes about and what it entails. I'll be, go I'll be going uh, um, through a lot of the details that are just hinted at here. Then we can ask if such an account provides resources for analyses that go beyond the small scale cases. And this is fast forward. If you want to envisage the upshot that this talk may have for you, uh, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to say something about um, what cooperation by agreement looks like in the small scale case. Not really engaging with the literature uh, there, only sort of um, hand waving uh, here uh, a bit, a little bit. But then I want to take that as um, a starting point for, for reflecting on uh, the normative structure of the European Union. So go as applied um, uh, as you can in terms of uh, international political theory. Okay, but building up um, the sort of theoretical uh, resources uh, for a few minutes, uh, let's do it this way and talk about commitments and cooperation um, just for the small scale case. So there, uh, Margaret Gilbert has suggested, others uh, have suggested that as well, that the basic idea uh, of a commitment can be illustrated in view of an agent's formation of an intention or their making uh, a decision. In both cases, the agent commits themselves to a certain course of action, right? So the commitment implies a normative constraint uh, for the agent, as uh, Margaret puts it, there is now something they ought to do, all else being equal. So you intend to uh, review the paper you've agreed to review for a journal, uh, and uh, if you form that intention or if you decide to do so, you for yourself uh, or place on yourself a uh, normative constraint of this sort. There's of course a worry of bootstrapping there, so if you want to say that the, the commitment um, uh, that just by deciding you give yourself a reason to do something, um, that that would be problematic uh, in, in a variety uh, of different scenarios, just uh, hinting at that here. But the general idea seems uh, rather clear. So you decide to do something, and that uh, so going forward will matter in how you deliber deliberate uh, about your actions, uh, your options, uh, and so on. Now take this, uh, and I've only started with uh, the sort of Gilbert's picture and formulation here. I'm going to leave that. What else? Everything, almost everything else she says. Um, about commitments uh, behind in a minute, but let's take it um, um, the way, uh, or in a, in a way, she's also sympathetic to to some kind of collective level or to the joint case, and say that agents who form a joint intention or make a joint decision, or who agree to fight together, they also occur incur commitments. So argu arguably. Um, and that's where um, dialectical strategies may differ. Uh, we'll, we're going to want to say that they each come to be socially committed to phi, where this includes both the commitment regarding phi and the commitment vis-a-vis -vis the respective other. So I'm going to gesture a little bit now, uh, and, but I'm not committed, committed to this 
the gestures themselves having any sort of further significance. But there, here, here's the idea. So we agree to write a paper together. That's an example that came up. Or we agree to go for a walk together, paint the house together, do something of this um, uh, elementary uh, sort. Then um, if I join, uh, enter this agreement uh, with you, with my partner in interaction, then what I think is, is sort of to be said about what's going on is that I, just as um, in forming an intentional making decision in the individual, individual case, I incur a commitment that is social. So we're talking about a joint activity, so if I intend uh, or decide to uh, engage in that activity, I commit to doing my part in the activity, so that's the one sign. But it's a, if it's a joint activity, I think um, we also need to say that the commitment is not just to doing my part, it's also a commitment to the other uh, in, as a partner in uh, the endeavor. That's the idea. So um, you, don't, you don't get an adequate picture of joint action by just thinking of um, the intentions of each of the individuals, right? They have to interrelate or interlock in some way. Uh, and you don't, it doesn't, it, well, of course, there's, there's sort of a host uh, of reasons uh, for going to a more elaborate, um, um, let's say, analysis um, of what's required, both in the, let's say, in the intentional uh, infrastructure of what's going on. But um, the, I want to make the minimal point here that what you need is um, uh, you need to capture that uh, agents who engage in that kind of cooperation uh, that they not, don't just individually relate to the thing to be done, they relate to each other uh, as well. There's no priority here, there's no left arm better than right arm, there's no uh, priority uh, in terms of sort of vertical versus horizontal uh, relations or whatever meta metaphoric uh, you, you may prefer here. Uh, I'm just saying uh, that both has to be in place and that uh, I think um, uh, is what's capable of rendering the idea of a social commitment uh, most plausible. So then uh, turning to cooperation by agreement more explicitly, let's say that A and B agree to FI together and then we can say that the agreement can but needn't take root in a sequential exchange, beginning with uh, one's initiative of the form let's fi and the other's appropriate uptake. Although, I want to say those are the very typical cases, right? So we, you, you ask people that are out on, out on a walk together, how did that come about? Uh, a very likely response is that one of them has said, let's do it, and the other joined in. That's, uh, you, we, well, I have a complicated story, more complicated story to tell about how these initiatives uh, work and I think they are a specific kind of speech act uh, there that also uh, implies social commitment of the sort I have in mind. Uh, but um, uh, this is just, uh, this is to be a tangent we don't really need to um, embark on right now. So it can take a sequential, it can have a sequential sort of uh, pre-history, it doesn't have to have it. Crucially, uh, we should uh, acknowledge the following, that's at least what um, I want to um, urge you to consider, that the agents by agreeing to co cooperate bring about two things, an intentional structure and a normative structure. And the intentional structure will um, comprise the relevant beliefs and interrelated intentions that together constitute their joint intention to fi. So that is what, what comes about and that, will, that is what will uh, in, um, help guide the, corporate act, the cooperative activity. And second, uh, by agreeing in that way and by taking the entering of an agreement to imply a social commitment, they uh, bring about a normative structure that again comprises their respective social commitments and corresponding social uh, obligations. Key to the normative structure 
uh, other agent social commitments regarding phi and to one another, where this, I take it, establishes a normative relationship between them as cooperators. More specifically, they each come to have social obligations regarding their phi together, and that is each incurs an obligation to do their part of and at least support the other in their phi together. So uh, we commit to doing this thing uh, together, and if the, com the commitment is um, understood as a constraint, not just on my reasoning, but as a constraint on the, um, say the deontic uh, status of the options uh, I have, then uh, that is, um, if uh, in place on both sides of the dyad, um, grounds uh, for speaking of uh, mutual obligations in the pers pursuit of phi uh, here. I think this structure can be established absent relations of power or authority between, the, between them, so we can have them uh, in a, a purely symmetric case uh, and independently of the exact nature of phi. This is contentious because um, I'm now saying that people can agree to commit crimes and if they agree to commit, if they can agree to, make, to commit crimes, uh, does this? And I'm saying yes. Does this come with a special sort of, of a normative relationship between them? Um, and I say yes. They are socially obligated, and that is, uh, I think, um, an important resource for explaining uh, why people actually follow through with collective criminal endeavors, because they are, uh, right, they're in it together. But um, uh, there is, it doesn't, that doesn't uh, undercut uh, um, the uh, further consideration we may have whether these uh, obligations are more than um, social obligations. So lots of people um, react to this framework um, in the following way. They say, you say commitment, then you say obligation, but uh, there are only moral obligations, so it can't be the case that the norm, the, the, there's a normative infrastructure that can be cashed out, uh, uh, sort of, let's say, without um, proper attention to uh, morality. I think this is um, it's it's well taken. It's well it's a well motivated. Um, uh, but theoretically rather poor uh, response. It's well motivated because uh, we don't want people to commit crimes, not jointly, not at all. But when, we, when they do, we still want to know how, how that works. Uh, and um, so they're, 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 I think the best explanation or the best uh, the overall account uh, will be that even if uh, agents cooperate on the basis of agreement, and even if uh, we want to say that they have uh, commitments and obligations in doing so, then um, it doesn't mean that these are uh, all things uh, considered very strong uh, obligations they have that may outweigh moral uh, considerations. Any agent uh, has a stronger reason not to commit a crime or not to do something, let's say, morally heinous, um, but they may still have a reason uh, to live up to their agreements. It's just, uh, in, the, in the best cases, uh, outweighed by the moral consideration. So that's uh, the, the picture. So, and I, I think just to mention the last element here, uh, we don't need to, uh, in, in so resisting the moralizing talk of this normative infrastructure of cooperation, we don't have to say that agreements are exchanges of promises. When we, when we say that agreements are, are, are something like exchanges of social commitments, um, we can stay clear of um, this sort of moral uh, ladenness. The structure emerging from agreements is in the most important respect similar to that of cooperation in response to an external urgency, but um, uh, to discuss these two uh, variants of cooperation I mentioned properly, uh, one would have to, to acknowledge that rescue scenarios are morally uh, laden in a way that the, um, uh, the pure agreement uh, scenarios aren't. But maybe um, I've, I've sort of flagged this here because it may uh, re-enter a part of the discussion 
uh, we're now going to have, or later going to have, about international cooperation. So the idea is um, to ask the following question, can this account of the structure of cooperation be applied to forms of international cooperation, and specifically cooperation among nation states? And uh, to get one worry out of the way, uh, yes, uh, as long as uh, we have a story to tell about why and how nation states qualify uh, as agents. We can, uh, so we can sidestep that, so we can engage in that debate uh, now, that will take us very, into a very different uh, domain, not, not the one I want to go there, but, uh, or we can say for the sake of argument uh, that the rest is an as if. So we're going to say, look, I have a, I have a case, I, I gave you a case, like A and B agree to do something together, they fight together, and now next, well, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to pretend that nation states can fulfill the roles of A, a and B. This is very common uh, in uh, international political theory to talk that way, but um, to properly uh, engage with the social ontological literature uh, in that field would of course require uh, much more time, right? So I have 10 more minutes uh, and I want to get um, um, uh, through a lot of more, uh, a lot of material that would make this more applied. So take that as an as if, uh, if, uh, if you don't buy uh, into a, a story that is to be told about nation states as agents. So I think a realistic uh, account of such international cooperation will have to maneuver between two uh, things. And to some of you, um, uh, this will sound familiar, and to others it won't. Uh, I can't help it, I can't really elaborate here, but it needs to be mentioned. So we need to maneuver between two things. Uh, one is the uh, re received orthodoxy in, uh, in international relations scholarship that depicts states as exclusively self-interested and the international arena as a state of nature. And uh, so that is, uh, um, the, the point there is uh, we should stay clear of that picture, of accepting that picture um, as plausible uh, right away, because it will not get us to a, a, um, a consideration of what, age, what nation states do in the international arena as cooperation. It will just be, um, uh, sort of very loose uh, set uh, of self-interested agents that don't um, uh, pursue common goals and especially not for their own sake. On the other hand we have to stay clear uh, of forms of globalist utopianism as I'd call it that view the global political order as capable of being state-like. It's not that simple. So the, the, glo the globalist utopia, that's my, my term now, maybe someone else uses it, I don't know. The term I choose now, now is uh, now a description of a view, possibly strawman, uh, but uh, a description of a view that says, well, you look, we're actually we're all in it together. We just have to have the right insight into how we're going to build the world, the, the, construct the world, global uh, order, and then it's going to be um, uh, pretty much family from here on out. Uh, and um, the, we have to stay, stay clear of that and find a way uh, of addressing um, issues of international cooperation uh, in the uh, space in between. Okay, so the case of the European Union. The case of the European Union is very interesting. Uh, not, not enough attention is being paid to it in international political theory, I take it. Uh, but it's the most uh, ambitious project of international cooperation so far, right? Of course, the, there, there are other um, international, transnational um, uh, unions and associations, uh, but the European Union has taken it very far. Uh, and so, um, and so if you want to study um, um, international cooperation as, a, as cooperation by agreement, for instance, uh, then that's uh, a good place to look. The EU can provide a test case for the applicability of the above account, I hold, uh, and conversely, the account of cooperation by agreement can provide a background for analyzing and evaluating the structure of uh, the EU. So analysis and evaluation um, will uh, eventually uh, go hand in hand if I get uh, through the most important points here. A central controversy uh, in the study of the EU as a political system is that between supranationalists and intergovernmentalists. 
that those views differ in their understanding of the political roles of the EU's main institutions. I list four, there's a bit of a debate how many of them are really central, but the four, the Commission, the Parliament, the European Council and the Council, um, uh, are. let's just, just highlight those, um, and the supranationalists and intergovernmentalists uh, disagree um, about the roles of these institutions and in, with respect to their diagnosis regarding the strength of the normative relationship between member states. So supranationalists have a, highly a picture of highly integrated, very good, highly integrated uh, uh, member states and the uh, intergovernmentalists give a reading of the institutional structure that is rather one of, um, well, coordinating uh, single agents uh, that are not yet merged into uh, one union. At any rate, the overall structure of the EU's main institution manifests legitimacy gaps that block straightforward talk of the EU as a state-like federal structure. So um, that's where supranationalists uh, tend to be more on the, say, the ideal uh, side um, of, uh, of, of one debate that is to be had, um, or the, the, the utopians, um, as they're sometimes uh, um, called, uh, and intergovernmentalists are, are more down to earth describing uh, what, what's going on. So, um, the EU can rather directly be seen as a corporate project on the base, uh, based on agreement, and I'm going to uh, illustrate this very, very uh, um, quickly. I'm going to jump a little bit um, by showing you selections from selected articles of the Lisbon Treaty, um, where, uh, and I'm just going to read um, a bit of it, I have a summary uh, in a moment. Um, where it says that the, the, the point uh, of the treaty is uh, the pursuit of uh, or the attainment of objectives uh, the member states have in common, uh, that they are striving for an ever closer union among the peoples of Europe, that in Article 2 uh, they are committed to the values of pluralism, tolerance, justice, rule of law uh, uh, and other places and so on and that uh, they are committed to the well-being uh, of, this, of its peoples and to many uh, further um, political values, among them um, solidarity among the, the member states. So in summary, the Lisbon Treaty makes explicit reference to common goals and common values. It documents the aims of the member states to cooperate in bringing about well-being, freedom and sustainable development as well as uh, in promoting cohesion and solidarity among the member states. It surely does not seem far off to view this as an agreement that comprises something like the normative import highlighted above. So you have two roots here. One is um, to focus solely on the legal scholarship uh, and treat this as the treaty it is. It's a contract. Uh, it's been ratified and um, only interpret is and all the normative in implications uh, um, in terms of what the legal uh, implications are. Or, and that's a route I favor and I'd suggest uh, um, philosophers take here, um, stay away from an overly legalistic uh, interpretation uh, and, and instead think about the, the nature of the agreement and the nature of um, the cooperation uh, more along the lines of the resources uh, we get by considering agreements and cooperation in, in small-scale cases. In pursuing its goals, I won't go into all the details of this, the EU, EU distinguishes um, between competences that are either exclusive to the EU as such, uh, shared between the EU as mem and, and, and its member states that are uh, coordinated by the EU and those are exclusive. Uh, that are exclusive to the member states. So I gave, I gave the, the policy areas that sort of uh, do uh, that sort of fall into these uh, categories of competences. I mentioned this only because they, they, they clear, clearly, uh, uh, according to the Lisbon Treaty, clearly the nature of the cooperation isn't to now do everything together, but the um, the nature of the cooperation, the nature of the union, uh, is to um, well move towards doing certain things together and uh, do other things 
uh, individually on the member state uh, level. So it has it, it's a four, it has four categories that's important uh, for certain um, uh, discussions. But um, uh, yeah, just to just to describe the nature a little more. So I can't really go into uh, the issue of burden sharing here, but there are, there are, and that's important to consider um, schemes for uh, burden sharing that are the best. I think the best example for how uh, within the how the European Union actually works uh, right now, um, the member states have agreed to um, uh, meet mutual uh, obligations, especially in fields like energy politics. Uh, common, for, common um, uh, foreign and security policies, uh, and uh, in terms like, uh, or in, in issues that, such as with terrorism or natural catastrophe. So then, um, then so they they help each other in those occasions, but those are really uh, regulated. I'm sorry, I have to go uh, one, two, three minutes. Oh, I'm taking uh, it out oh. of the discussion. So yeah. yeah, yeah, can take it out of the discussion. That's fine. Uh, so, the present schemes uh, resemble accords between self-interested states much more than solidary cooperation within a single community. That's the upshot of the consideration of burden uh, sharing. Uh, and there's um, a, an area, uh, so I want to pose a, num a number of, uh, of questions, and now I'm going over time, being very uh, strict here. Uh, uh, but I want to raise a number of questions that um, should urge us to consider um, the cooperation, international cooperation, that is the European Union, uh, in a sort of different spirit. As follows, doesn't the avowed commitment to the pursuit of joint goals in the spirit of solidarity point towards a more extensive acknowledgement of mutual obligation in the case of divergent developments? So I want to know, or we should ask ourselves, what the extent of the obligations is that are occur incurred under the agreement to cooperate. What if we resist recourse to a legalistic understanding of the structures uh, and instead uh, point to directed obligations to lend support and assistance? So let uh, and I have and I have a series uh, of, of data that would be interesting to look at. Maybe we, you want to look at in uh, in the Q and A. Um, it, it's not. Uh, necessary to go all through the details, but the story uh, that I think needs to be told about this form of international cooperation, need, uh, that needs to take into account that member states fare very differently in, uh, in the European Union, and um, the fact uh, or the ways the cooperation is designed uh, um, tells a lot about um, uh, how far the member states are in fact committed uh, to solidarity and so on. So this is, da this is data from the Bertelsmann Foundation for 2016. It shows in various boxes how individual member states, all 28, another five months, six months, uh, all 28 fair, uh, and look at the, the headline uh, with, with respect, uh, so in the development, uh, with respect to here risk uh, of poverty uh, and social exclusion and uh, so what I do with the boxes is I say there are individual member states who, care, who, who do very badly according to the data uh, which uh, I, I, hold, I hear uh, is correct um, um, uh, and of course and specifically these member states fare far worse uh, than others so what um, let's uh, Take a very telling example, um, which the, the, this, um, in terms of severe material deprivation, the data for Greece is that between 2008, that's the column here on the left, and 2016, um, severe material deprivation has doubled. So the percentage of the population that is severely materially deprived uh, has doubled uh, in Greece uh, uh, in that time. Or uh, in uh, what, what's that uh, unemployment rate for Croatia? Croatia only joined in 2013, but anyway, unemployment uh, has doubled in Croatia. Uh, and um, in, there's a host of groups as well. There are, of course, always uh, on the bottom of the scale. They're not Germany, Austria, Denmark, <coughs> Netherlands. Uh, they're on the top. Um, so, in terms of youth unemployment, uh, there are some uh, very disconcerting, disquieting uh, figures here if you think uh, of the 
almost 50% uh, of young uh, unemployed, that's under 24, uh, in Greece uh, and Spain, and also double figures. You don't see the colors here very well, but that's the general um, uh, depiction by the Bertelsmann Foundation, is that Southern Europe here, red, uh, does very badly in terms of what they compile as a just social justice index. And the further north, the further Sweden you go, um, the, um, the greener uh, the, the colouring gets. I'll conclude in a moment. Um, I think the challenge for the EU as a cooperative project lies in addressing divergences in terms of obligations that are in line with, possibly implied by, but not made explicit in the legal form of its agreement. So, you get, you have uh, the Lisbon Treaty, it has a lot of political rhetoric uh, of solidarity and the spirit of solidarity. You have in the same, in the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union, you have a host of regulations uh, that say how burdens are shared if something very, very bad happens. But you have no provisions uh, for meeting uh, the challenges posed by divergent developments I've just illustrated. So, Arguably, it's in virtue of their explicit agreement that the member states are, or let's say would be, in a privileged position to support uh, each other. And I'm now looking only at their, at their uh, relationship. Obviously, uh, say Germany is in a very good position to lend support to others, non-European Union uh, countries, but um, they are not in the same sort of framework of an agreement. A specifically political issue arises, of course, in squaring these directed and mutual obligations of states qua member states with the several reasonable concerns for safeguarding the claims of the citizens of these uh, member states. So every time uh, a proposal would be made, let's say in, in Germany, to uh, redistribute, uh, it would be uh, sold as a loss to, um, let's say, increase of wealth. Uh, uh, in the country itself, so that's the that's the bit of a problem. Uh, it may be that we want to say that an agreement is less binding if it's entered in ignorance of possible conflicts with other obligations. So it may be that uh, we can't say they're committed to helping each other because they didn't know how difficult this would get. But we shouldn't say that holding up one's end of the agreement is entirely optional and never fit to outweigh um, self-regarding concerns. Last slide. Uh, all the text at once. Cooperation by agreement, that's what I wanted to say, is best accounted for in terms of specific intentional and normative structures. The account I propose highlights the way in which agreements are constituted by social commitments and give rise to mutual obligations to be cooperators. That's another result. We could easily construct and stay just in the small scale and uh, sort of typical uh, methodology and construct cases uh, where, um, which bring out the limits uh, and potential breakdown of agents' fulfillment of their obligations. But we can, and that's what the, the, sort of the, the look at international cooperation of the EU should, should have done, um, we can show uh, how following through with one's intentions and decisions, living up to one's commitments and honoring the agreement one has entered is complicated. We will, uh, that's what I want to submit in conclusion, learn something about the normative structure of cooperation if we understand what determines the reach uh, of commitment. That's it. Thank, Thank you. you.